19th. And you got it, uh, Dennis, you're recording. Okay, so I'm gonna introduce our speaker tonight. She's a, a workmate of mine. Uh, we, we worked on, uh, at, well, for all four city museums, Brannigan Cultural Center and Museum of Art in particular for exhibits and things like that. And uh, Jennifer McClung is the exhibits curator at the Las Cruces Museums and was responsible re for researching and developing the Cleared for Takeoff Aviation in Southern New Mexico exhibit uh, that's among others that she's done, but that's showing now and it's gonna be showing through the rest of, pretty much the rest of this year. It should be up and on display at the brand again. So if you get a chance to come to the brand and come see that exhibit, it's, it's filled with stuff and she's gonna cover just a small portion of it tonight. Uh, she holds a master of arts in museum science and a bachelor of arts in history. So Jennifer, would you come join us here? And I'm going to share your screen here. Yeah, because I don't trust that I know. <laughs> okay, let's get it going here. Okay, it should go. Where am I? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, <laughs> hi. <laughs> um, it's really good to be here. It's been a while since I've done one of these kinds of presentations. So um, I hope you will bear with me if I start stuttering and getting a little nervous. Um, so I just, the exhibit um, is a wealth of information that covers a broad range of topics that starts with um, the 1916 punitive expedition, which Garland has spoken about to you all before. So I'm not going to address that. And then it, it kind of goes into World War II and then civilian aviation um, in the Las Cruces area. So um, it will be up through at least October. So if, if you hear anything today that sparks your interest, um, you've got some time to go and see it before it closes. And um, let's see, before I get started with the, the presentation, I do want to give appropriate credit where credit is due. And um, we had a lot of assistance with pulling this exhibit together and with the images that are I'm going to be showing you all. So I would like to give credit to Bob Crawford and his family, Morris Drexler, the Library of Congress, the National Archives, and of course, the NMSU Library Archives and Special Collections and Dennis Daly, who was very responsive when I would call him up. and was like, I need a scan of this edition of the newspaper and he'd go off and do it. So um, that helped really make this exhibit a much more interesting and dynamic one than it would have been if we hadn't had the support of these people and um, the, the images that they had. So we will start now with our first slide. And um, so this first slide is the 1935 aeronautical map. And the reason why I'm showing it to you all, it looks a little out of focus. Um, I hope you can kind of see it. But it was just to give you all an idea of just how empty the landscape was in this area with regards to aviation. There is nothing at all in Las Cruces in 1935. And um, there's just a little strip here in Deming that um, has a little airfield. So this was just to give you an idea that by 35, there wasn't anything. And then of course, World War II happened. <laughs> And you start getting airfields being built. And um, in this area, the Deming airfield was, Army airfield was constructed. And this was an aerial photograph of Deming um, in 43. So it gives you an idea of um, the lay of the land there, the little community. And then right over here um, in the left, middle left hand screen, um, you can kind of see the tail end of one of the runways that was constructed for the airport. And one of the things that I found kind of amusing was um, a 1942 um, publication 
in the Deming newspaper that was put out by the Chamber of Commerce. And it was talking about how great it was. And this, the president of the Chamber of Commerce met, you know, the army officials and they walked the land and saw the new construction. But what I really liked was um, when he said, one can hardly realize that only a few weeks ago, this location was full of mesquite bushes and overrun with rabbits. Now we have a model and beautiful camp for our friends that will soon begin to come in and fill these fine buildings. And I just thought it was, it was amusing that the Chamber of Commerce was talking about um, overrun with rabbits and full of mesquite. So, oops. Um, and with Deming, Deming um, was a little bit specialized in that it was a bombardier training facility. And so this was the bombardier pin that they would have worn when they passed their tests. And this was the um, shoulder patch that they would wear when they graduated from the Deming Army Air Force force field. Um, and of course, if for, for those who know anything, um, this is the takeoff on the Wicked Witch out of the Snow White series or movie, Disney movie. And the, the airplane that they used in the training there at the Deming Field was the AT-11 bomber. And um, it, it's not a very sexy airplane, but it had a really good capacity, weight capacity, so that you could load it up. Um, they would go up with like 10 bombs and they would go up with two trainees and they would take turns on, on dropping the bombs and attempting to hit the little pyramid target that you see in your lower left-hand image. This image actually comes from a yearbook from the Deming um, Army Air Force Base. And so this is an example. They would grade these huge concentric circles. Um, there would be an outer ring and then some inner rings with this pyramid in the center of it. And that's what they would try to, to target when they would drop the bombs. And the bombs had, um, uh, they were sand bombs with a little explosive at the end so that you could tell when they would hit the ground and how close they were to the targets. Um, and the thing that I found really interesting, which had absolutely nothing to do with the exhibit, but I wedged it in the exhibit, was the fact that in 1943, they made a movie about bombardiers. And it was actually nominated for two Oscars for Best Special Effects in Photography and Sound. They didn't win, but they were nominated. And the other thing that was really interesting about it was that it was actually filmed at the Kirkland Army Airfield in Albuquerque. And they used um, trainees as like the background extras. And they also used um, actual flying instructors as the pilots for the montage at the very end of the movie where um, they had a, a bunch of B-57s that were flying off into the sunset. So I've been trying to track this movie down because I would love to just watch it, but um, I don't think T Turner Classic Mo Movies has it, but I really would like to to get a copy of it and maybe show it before the exhibit closes because I don't know, it just seems kind of fun. Um, so here we have a 1940 aeronautical map. And this again is just to kind of show you how things are changing um, as, as things are evolving militarily. Um, and here you're gonna see in the right hand center, right hand corner, um, the landing strip that was out Highway 70 out by Oregon. And you'll also notice um, the Deming Field is there. But as of 1940, those are still the only two fields that are in the area. And um, NMSU had training. I'm going to call it NMSU, even though it wasn't titled that in the 1930s and 40s. Um, NMSU had a civilian pilot training program. And interestingly enough, they would let women enroll and become certified in training. And two of the women who were some of the first to enroll were um, Gay French and Kathleen Kelly. And it was noteworthy enough that they made it in the, um, the, the newspaper. 
And the cool thing about Kathleen Kelly was they both had said that, oh, we just enjoy doing it. It's just kind of fun to be up in the air by ourselves. Yet she would go on to become, to go to the Avenger Field in Sweetwater, Texas, and actually become a certified flying Women's Air Force Service pilot or WASP. And she would go on to fly for like two years um, running airplanes and um, ferry, acting as a ferry pilot for aircraft to get them to military bases so that the men could then fly them um, off into the war. And another woman um, that was also really involved in the Las Cruces area with aviation was Nell Ruth Routon. And um, she she offered, um, she was originally from Albuquerque, I believe it is, and came down here. She, she learned to fly in Albuquerque, but then learned more here in town and offered charter services and mail services and offered to teach flying instruction to students. And interestingly enough, she was petitioning to become an instructor in Deming, Lordsburg, Albuquerque, and Silver City. And um, for whatever reasons, in 1941, they actually gave half of those permits to, to men who had applied after she had already applied for those um, permits. But she did ultimately become able to teach in Albuquerque, I'm sorry, Almogordo and Silver City, as well as Las Cruces. And the men got Deming and, and Lordsburg. So this is the original 1940 Highway 70 hangar. Um, it, it's the one that was way out Highway 70 in that aerial map that I showed you. Um, and it looks really nice. Looks pretty, looks stable, looks good. You've got an airplane, you've got a little outbuilding, you've got radar. However, it, it was, there, there was a notice in the roundup in September of 1940 about how it had been finished and they were so proud of it. And um, it had corrugated metal over wood stripes. And then there was a really bad windstorm in January just what six months later and the building blew down completely <laughs> they found they found sheets of like peeled off metal like a, a half a mile away and it just completely imploded and the other interesting thing about it is Nell Ruth Nell um, was there when it blew up along with um, a man who would become kind of a technician for animation training program um, Bob Chamberlain. Um, so they just were sitting in their car just watching this building completely blow up in front of them and there wasn't anything they could do to stop it. So that is an interesting little bit of, of unfortunate history. But since it's the war and there's still WPA funds available, um, the, the university got right on it and was able to solicit um, WPA funds and, and military funds to rebuild it. And not only did they rebuild it, but they, they built it with reinforced concrete block this time. <laughs> and also um, put, a, could, put a good hardy steel roof on it. So it wasn't gonna blow away this time. But um, as part of the, the, the money that they were asking for to build would all, was also going to include an air mechanics laboratory so that um, pe people, people could be trained not so much in the flying, but in actual um, hands-on training for how to do the repair to the engines of the, the airplanes. So um, this newspaper article um, is just talking about the university um, applying for and receiving those funds and, and that it's going to be used for the construction of this air mechanics lab, laboratory and a new hangar. And unfortunately, I looked all over the place to try to find a photograph after it had been built or a newspaper article about announcing that it had been reopened, and I couldn't find one. So if there's one out there, I would love to get my hands on it. But we do have um, a 2001 photograph of the um, Highway 70 hangar 
This is before it got converted. So it still has its original hangar doors. Um, in the 50s and 60s, after it was kind of decommissioned, it kind of became a dance hall. So that's why you have Tavern of Music written on the side of it. Um, but it still has its original um, WPA acknowledgement pla plaque on it in the date of construction. Currently, it is a church and the um, hangar doors have been filled in and a regular kind of you know, domestic door has been inserted there where the hangar doors are, but it still looks pretty much like that, just with those modifications in it. Um, and the air mechanics laboratory is now the biology annex, and that's located at the intersection of Stewart Street and William Avenue. It's just kind of catty corner actually from the archives, um, library and archives building. So this is um, the WPA stickers that are on the Air Mechanics building. And again, I wasn't able to find any period pictures of it from the front, but fortunately there are some pictures of it from the back side um, that are, are a couple slides ahead. So um, before they built, let me go back, before they built the Air Mechanics Laboratory, um, they had a building on campus where they were doing some of this work with working with engines and, and training people on how to do that. And I haven't been able to locate where that building was. So if anybody has any information about where that building was, I would love to hear that because we have, oops, sorry, wrong way. Um, we have these in, interior photographs of the building, but this is not the air mechanics building because the windows are all wrong and, and the layout of the building is all wrong. So we know it's not the new air, air mechanics building, but I would love to know where it is. But again, you see all the different, um, all the different engines that were out for the men to um, learn how to use. You've got airplanes and gears and propellers um, laying around. You've got men learning how to weld um, in this picture. And in this picture, they're not really doing anything, but it gives you an idea of the different kinds of airplanes um, that were laying around. These are more kind of glider. They're not so much war. So, and if you look at the the text font on these, these things. It might be pre-World War II. I just, uh, this was one thing I wasn't able to find more information about before I had to start actually doing the exhibit. So I would love to find out more about this building. And there's the last picture, but you see, you know, obviously these are not military airplanes. Um, they look like little gliders and stuff, but the men are in here learning how to work with them. This, however, is the south side of the air mechanics building. And you see here um, in the center left corner of the photograph, the, the huge doors that will allow you to take an airplane in and out of the building. And then um, some of the men standing around with airplanes that they've been working on. The other thing that's kind of interesting is in the middle right hand side of the image, you will see a bunch of buildings and these are all temporary housing for the students um, that were learning at the school at the period of time because there was this huge influx of students um, and they needed a place to put them. So this, um, these are some really nice interior shots of people working um, and learning, you know, again, how to, how to handle an engine and how to put a tire on an airplane <laughs> and more, more engine work on an airplane. And again, in this picture um, here back in the back in the middle of the right hand, you'll see some more of those temporary housing um, units that were on campus. And this is another backside image of the air mechanics building. And I always forget the name of this tower, but it's, it's one that you obviously know if you know the NMSU campus. Um, but again, you've got your airplanes laid out um, in various, various breeds. 
<laughs> they're not breeds, they're makes of airplane. Um, and if you, if, if you were to like drive down this hump and follow it all the way out to the left-hand corner, um, that would take you to the air, the airstrip that they did do um, landings. And, you know, they, they would work on the airplanes and take them out and make sure they could fly. So this is a 1944 aeronautical map. And here you start seeing um, a little bit more of the development. You still have the highway um, 70 airstrip out to the right-hand side of the image in Las Cruces proper, way right here. You see the college airstrip and then Deming is also over here getting bigger. The other interesting thing to note about this slide is um, you now have areas where it's danger. So you can tell that there, there is airspace that you are not supposed to be entering into with this image. And on the far right-hand side, um, this is a crop down version of the map. So if you go east of the mountains, obviously you're running into the White Sands area. And that's why that is marked as a danger zone. So um, the university liked having an airstrip and they were purchasing land even after the war ended to um, expand the facilities, expand a runway. Um, there's really interesting um, oh, uh, president meetings, uh, I forget what they're called, um, but where the, the regents, there we go, the regents would get together and talk about buying land and trying to get land and, and um, getting, uh, what, what are the terms? I've forgotten the terms, but quit deeds, quit, quit, quit deeds, is that what it's called? Anyway, um, quit claims um, to get some more land for the airstrip. So it's really interesting if you go into the archives files and go through some of the regents meetings, um, just the information you can find about the, the airstrip there at the university. Here is probably a image that dates to the late 1940s, early 1950s. And again, this building right here, this kind of double stacked building on the right hand side is the air mechanics building. Um, you'll you see right here, there's a bunch of airplanes, there's an airplane, and way over here is a really big airplane. So these were all, they were still teaching um, them, um, you know, just basic mechanic works because at the time it, it still was an agricultural mechanic arts school. So that's a really interesting photograph, especially if, if you know the campus. Um, so after the war ended, it was kind of like, well, what, we've got this airstrip. What do we do with it now? So Bob Crawford, who is the Mr. Aviation in Las Cruces, um, started teaching civilians and GIs um, just basic civilian flight so that they could then go out and, you know, become crop dusters or offer um, shuttle, shuttle flights to uh, communities in the local area. Um, and this one was really kind of interesting because I found this newspaper advertisement where he's, you know, ask, soliciting people to come and learn how to fly. Um, and it listed the names of all the people in the photograph. And I found the corresponding image in the archives, but it didn't list the names of the people. So it, it was nice that I was actually able to, to give Dennis a little bit of information that they didn't have in their their records um, as part of this this adventure in in learning about aviation and this man squatting here on the outside left is Bob Crawford um, the man squatting on the far right is um, Bob Chamberlain and both of those men um, stuck around uh, the university, stuck around the Las Cruces downtown airport and were very well known in the aviation community. Um, and again, he, um, Bob was, uh, because 
the government was paying for GIs to go back and learn trades and learn skills. Um, Bob did a lot of targeting for veterans um, and also for farmers because this was a, a farming area, obviously, to learn how to fly and, and the things that you can do um, by knowing how to fly. Um, and he, he put out a lot of advertisements while he was doing that. Um, the other interesting thing is, is because like that one photograph I showed you, there were all these kind of airplanes laying around the campus by the um, air mechanics building. Um, Bob Chamberlain, the man I mentioned previously, had to put an editorial in the roundup that was like, please stay off the airplanes. <laughs> Please stop parking on the airstrip and stay off the airplanes. Don't damage them. Um, so it, they become common enough that the students were, were very kind of common, you know, were very casual in their approach about how to deal with these um, airplanes that were on their campus. Um, now in 71, let me get my notes. Um, NMSU decides that there's just too much going on and they really are not interested in maintaining the airport there on campus anymore. The interstate highway had been constructed, Memorial Highway had been constructed and the airstrip kind of like went over both of those and was causing really pro big problems with safely landing and taking off with the airplanes. So they decide um, in 71 to do away with it. And needless to say, many people are, who fly are very upset with this because by 1968, the downtown or airport had been closed. So by 71, there was just the one on campus and then the one that is still existing way out um, west of town. So people were saying, please don't close it. We don't want to travel out there, but they decide to close it. And in September 30th of 1971, it's dead, it's gone. But the interesting thing that happens, <laughs> they've got this big airstrip. What do we do with this airstrip? Well, you have hot rod rides, competition, drag races on them. And for a period of time in 73 and 74, these are the ones that I saw advertisements for. I'm not sure if they offered it before or after, but I, I just thought it was really interesting that they decided to utilize the airstrip as a place to have drag drag races and that the university seemed okay with that, which from a liability aspect seems a little, seems a little interesting. Um, but I, I would also really like to do a lot more research about the drag strips, the, the drag races that went on at the old um, airstrip. Um, so these are photographs um, as the university decides that they're no, go no longer going to allow, allow drag racing, um, that they're going to develop the area. So here, the big black slash that you see um, through the center of the photograph is the old airstrip. And you'll notice there are big X's um, written on it throughout the length of the image. And that's so that pilots know that this is not an active airstrip, you are not to land on it. So that is one of the images. And what they ended up putting um, where the airstrip was is the football stadium. So this shows the football stadium under construction and there um, in the middle, upper middle of the image, you have the uh, remain of the airstrip cutting through there. And of course that gets paved over and there's buildings and parking there now. So that takes care of the University Airport. Now we have the downtown airport, and I'm going to steal a sip of water so that I can make it through the next part. So, um, originally, uh, a newspaper report described the establishment of the downtown airport as being scraped out of the desert in 1937, 39, sorry, 1939 which is kind of true. Um, it was located at the intersection of Solano and Handley, Hadley, I always mispronounce that street, Hadley and Solano, and took up all the space to the east of that. 
Um, and one of the interesting things I found was in 1941, the county had gotten some land on that side of town to put in a cemetery, a pauper cemetery, but it cut across the um, airport land. And so they, when they realized it, they were like, ah, that, we can't have that happening. Um, and one man even said, but I don't believe airplane pilots would relish the idea of landing in a public cemetery. It might be too suggestive of their ultimate end. So what they ended up doing was doing a land swap so that the universe, the airport could have the land without crossing a cemetery and the cemetery could go in lands that wouldn't impact the airport, which I, I just thought that was interesting. The other little bit of interesting information that I found out while doing the research was the establishment of a, I think they called it a coffee shop and dance hall, but it was a bar and dance hall at the airport inn, and it was located at 1200 East Las Cruces Avenue, which is just like two blocks southeast of the airport. And it bordered on the Mountain View Heights subdivision. And a lot of the residents there did not want this dance hall bar being built there. And so there was a big to do about it. And um, they were able, they had a, like a petition sign up to allow it or disallow it. And this was a newspaper advertisement from Bridget Sabold who was the owner of the airport in just thanking everybody who signed the petition saying that they wanted the bar to be there because it ended up actually happening. Um, although unfortunately in 1951, in August of 1951, there was a massive fire there that kind of gutted the building. And sadly people like broke in and stole cigarettes out of the cigarette machine and took money out of the coin change machine. Um, but at that point, the, the residents again thought they had an opportunity to block the rebuilding of it and went before council to pr pr protest the established reestablishment of this bar. But the city said, yeah, they, they meet their permits, they're allowed. So they went back into business and had a grand reopening to rub it in everybody's <laughs> face <laughs> um, in October of that year. And they had a big party and dance. And um, this bar actually managed to stay in business until May of 1970. Um, they, at that point in time, um, she decided to retire and they put the building up for, well, the, the business up for sale. Um, I'm not sure if anybody bought it and continued it after the fact, though. Again, I need to do some, some more research on that. So here you have the 1957 aeronautical map. Um, you will notice that we are just swimming with airports now. The Again, the Highway 70 airport has been long gone, but you've got the Las Cruces downtown airport. You still have the University Airport, and then you have the West Airport as well, as well as the one that still exists in Deming. But after the war, um, the Army Air Force turned the their airport over to the city of Deming. So that airport is um, a city run airport after the war. Here is an aerial view of the downtown um, airport looking east towards the Oregon mountains. And you'll, you will notice that, oh look, there's a, there's a street that starts in the lower left-hand corner and it runs downtown and it jogs a little and oh look, it runs straight into the airport. And that's kind of how the airport was situated. It was right there on the corner of town at the time the corner the edge of town there's like nothing anywhere anywhere around it so it was a safe place at the time to have that airport but i like that that view this is another um image of it from a little yeah, a little bit more northwest um but again just kind of showing this on the upper right hand corner is a mountain um, and then you can just see how there is absolutely no development, no anything to the east of town other than the airport. Uh, let's see. And the airport, Mr. Aviation Bob Crawford, um, he, after, from 1947 till 1970, 
1975. He was the manager of the downtown airport and um, every pilot in within, I don't know, 400 miles um, knew Bob Crawford because everybody flew into the downtown airport to meet with him and talk with him and, and just spend time with him. Um, he came in to the Las Cruces area actually before the war and did some of the civilian air training that happened before the war and right at the beginning of the war and then was rotated out to Texas and then came back to Las Cruces um, after the war ended and as we saw did some stuff at the university airport and then moved downtown and was stationed out of the downtown airport from then on. Um, one of his warnings, given the fact that um, Hadley essentially runs into the airport, is that he would always say, be careful and don't come down too fast or you'll run the stop sign at Hadley. And if you look at this image, you know, here's the airport, here's all the banks. Oh, look, there's Hadley and there's Solano. Um, and there Hadley goes. So really you could easily run over the landing strip and just kind of like barrel on down Hadley. Okay. Yeah, um, so I, I, I wasn't able to find a place to wedge that into the exhibit, but I really thought that was a funny quote. And he, he apparently had a really kind of dry sardonic wit. And so just kind of kind of going, yeah, you're gonna run to the, you're gonna pass up the, the stop sign is an example of that. And these are just some qu uh, quick image of um, some of the pilots there at the um, downtown airport. This pilot right here is Leela Carwardine. Car uh, uh, Carwardine, sorry, it's late. My tongue's tired. <laughs> Carwardine, there we go. Um, and she drove, or she flew this Cessna 120 um, and it was the Pink Pride. And her story, Leela's story is really kind of interesting because um, she was a math teacher at Las Cruces High School for like 31 years. And she was, it was 1946 when she decided to be a pilot and she was born in 19, 1894. So she had grown children at the time and she went up to Bob Crawford and she said, can you teach your grandmother how to fly? And he said, of course. And so he taught her, but the, uh, an interesting story about Leela is that um, she had a little bit of difficulty with her landings. And one of the times that she was landing, she was in Bob's airplane, um, learning how to do it and ended up just like topping it and roll it. Well, she didn't roll it, but she just crashed it and destroyed the airplane. But she still managed to um, get her pilot's license and she would fly for the next two, let's see, 30 years. And she would cover, she would fly to every state in the United States, Canada, Mexico, the Caribbean islands. She would do it competitively and then also just for pleasure. And um, her airplane, the Pink Pride, was sold in 1975 after she did her last solo flight at the age of 82. So that is a testament and a great lady who I would have loved to have met. So, um, so between the period of the mid 50s into the mid 60s, Las Cruces is growing, developments are being built, they're being built on the east side of town and the airport's there. And so um, starting probably around 1961, actually the city started thinking, we really gotta close this airport down. It's just not meeting our needs there. We have the West Airport. We don't need this other one. So they finally made the decision by 1967 that the airport was done. They were gonna close it. Um, Part of that also was the FAA was really nervous about having the airport that close to um, residential dwellings and neighborhoods. So the airport, let me check my notes here. Um, yes. So the airport gets closed. 
they close it December 31st and a couple months later they're already doing the demolition work on taking down the airport and what ends up going into the airport area is, as you all know, the massive kind of city recreation area with baseball fields and, and soccer fields and all sorts of development um, that is not showing up in this 1976 photograph of it. But if you'll, um, you know, you can see these circles in the middle lower corner um, that are the start of baseball diamonds and other baseball diamonds. So this area gets completely developed um, with recreational areas for the citizens of Las Cruces. In this area, you can't really see the old airport. It's up in the tippy top left-hand corner, but I just really like this image because um, it shows the interstate. It probably dates to like about the same time, 67, 68. Um, it shows the retaining wall here. Um, that is behind all the businesses that now are on the east side of the interstate and just the big Arroyo area that now has housing on it. And this is the in the center of it, kind of dead center, um, you've got a water tank. That's the water tank that's decorated. And you've got a hotel here. And then Walmart takes up this entire block right behind it, just to kind of give you a little bit of orientation in case like me, sometimes I, I have a hard time figuring out where things are from an aerial perspective. But the interesting thing about Las Cruces was that it really did have a really active um, civilian aviation community. They had a specific newspaper article that ran in the paper weekly um, from 1946 until the mid 1970s. Um, these are just a few examples that you had flying around the Sea Valley, um, flying time, and then the final issue was flight line. So those are really good resources. Um, it's really kind of interesting because they're just kind of chatty, gossipy things about, you know, who flew into the airport and who, who was with them and who was flying out of the airport and where were they going. Um, and and um, one of them, you know, talked about loading up a bunch of people in an airplane and going and seeing um, an NMSU football game in, in Arizona. So it's just kind of those gossipy kind of um, columns, which are kind of fun to read. The other thing that went on in the local area because it was a farming area was crop dusting. And that was one of the services that Bob Crawford offered as well as managing the airport. And um, in doing the research, I came across a, some an oral history society that had done some oral histories that had talked about aviation and Bob Crawford. And there was just this really great, great quote from Jim Boykin about crop dusting and how, um, you know, if people didn't know what they were doing, they would get in trouble. If they missed the power lines, they would really get in trouble. But that Bob had this kind of devil may care attitude and he would just go, eh, yeah, I almost missed that tree down there. Eh. Um, and he, apparently he was just really fearless about his flying and, and doing it. And this is a picture of Jim um, laying down some herbicide on, on a field. And there's an advertisement for his services that he rendered and the city actually would hire him to spray DDT for mosquitoes back in the day. And the other interesting story that I just found so mind boggling that I had to include in the exhibit was apparently um, stop, stop, yeah. Stallman Farms had an issue with crows once in November and they, they kept trying to figure out a way to get rid of the crows and run them off. And finally, Bob was like, you know, I could get up there with, a, with an airplane and have my buddy in the passenger seat, seat and he could just shoot them. And the farmer and, and um, Dean was like, okay, that sounds like a good plan. And so they spent two months like flying around the pecan orchards, shooting crows out of an airplane. And it just seems so absurd that of course it had to go in the exhibit. Now, um, Bob retires from the downtown airport in January of 75. And to honor all of his contribution for over 30 years, um, they decide to have a, a, a roast for him as a way of saying goodbye. And um, Joe Gold, who was a, a, a student of his, 
and a notorious flyer in the area and who unfortunately passed away um, just before the exhibit opened um, wrote that he, he claims he, he taught the Wright brothers how to fly, but I don't believe there's quite a bit of truth in that, but that um, Bob did learn how to fly during the barnstorming days of the 1930s. He would skip school, go out to where these, um, these devil may care barnstormers were and learn all about flying. So that probably accounts for his his attitude when he was doing some of the crop dusting. But um, the, 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 um, the write up on the right hand side is um, from a state aviation official, just really honoring the fact that of the contribution that Bob provided to the field of aviation, not just in the Las Cruces area, but you know, he would go out when there were planes that went down, he would go out there and rescue missions. If there were people missing in the desert, he would go out on rescue missions. So Bob really was quite an influential um, person in the aviation field here in the Las Cruces area. And unfortunately, a, a year later, he would pass away. So this is 1975. You have got the air, the downtown airport has been closed, but if you look really closely on this map, right in the center of Las, the Las Cruces yellow, you'll see an H. And for a period of time, there was a helicopter landing pad at the old um, airport, but that didn't last for very long. And then you've got the West Airport, and then of course Deming still has their airport. And we will now talk about the West Airport. And um, it was originally constructed as an auxiliary landing field for the Deming Air Army Air Field, um, and it had a, a huge runway. And um, so that was its genesis was um, in the war as an auxiliary landing field. And it was really kind of interesting. And again, I ran out of time doing the research, um, but there seemed to be that the city owned it and they leased it out to the army. And then after the war was over, there was some question about whether or not they would give it back to the city or whether they were gonna hold it to be a military base. And then ultimately they decided to give it back to the city to hold as a civilian airport. Um, but they had a big grand opening in 1943 for it. Um, and that was kind of its dedication. This is, a, is the earliest photograph I've been able to track down of the West Airport and Bob Crawford took it. Um, he, he was also a photographer that would take really good photographs out of, you know, leaning out of his airplane. Um, so this you will notice um, a big field with landing fields and then like three tiny little buildings in the center of it. And that's really what all there was out there for a long time. Um, in 48, the Civilian Aeronautics Authority, which is now the FAA, um, gives the city approval to use the airport and they start doing charter services with Pioneer Airlines. Um, they do airmail delivery. Um, the little map of Texas, New Mexico kind of shows the jig jag of all the different places that um, these carriers could go and deliver the mail because back then, you know, it, a lot of the air, a lot of the mail delivery was done by airlines instead of by truck. Um, so we did have a number of airline carriers flying out of the West Airport. They would fly to Albuquerque and Santa Fe and Silver City and Alamogordo. They would go into Texas. So they'd get, fly to Amarillo and Fort Worth and Midland, um, just kind of those places. The, the one, the image in the center um, kind of shows all the hop, skipping and jumping that they're doing between New Mexico, Colorado, and Arizona. 
So as you see, I, I've listed kind of the major carriers there and, and the timeframes that they were flying out of the West Airport. And, you know, from 48 to the mid 50s, there's a good chunk of time where there's consistent flying. And then there's like a 20 year period where there were some minor carriers that would come in, stay for a year or two and then leave. Um, and that's kind of been the story of carrier air, airlines out at the West um, Airport. Part of it is just Americans like to drive their cars, even if it takes longer. Um, but so this is the airport in 1968. And you'll notice there have been a couple additions, some hangars and um, some other buildings have been added in the intervening years. After Bob dies in 76, there's a movement among the aviation people here in town to recognize him and to change the name of the West Airport to the Las Cruces Crawford Air Airport. And the city decides that that is indeed appropriate and they rename the airport um, in 76 after Bob Crawford. This is an image from the mid 70s. I just like this image a whole, whole lot. <laughs> Morris Drexler took this image. I just, I think it's a really cool one. Back when they would actually put the name of the airport, I mean, the city of the airport um, on the landing strip. So in 1979, they're like, we gotta, we gotta get this um, up and running again. We've gotta get some, some things going on at this facility. So they, they um, build a new, terminal building out at the airport and they open up some new hangars and they have a, a really big event uh, with parachute jumps and, and targeted landings and, and other competitive aerial um, acrobatics went on that weekend. Um, but unfortunately, <laughs> 1981, there's this whole full page article in the El Paso Times about how the airport is kind of just sitting out there waiting, waiting for, to be used. Um, so they, they, they are still having problems. And about the same time, St. Teresa decides to build their airport to better serve the El Paso community. And so there's really a lot of discussion about the viability of the airport um, in the early 1980s. So what they decide kind of as a workaround in 1984 is that it will become an international airport allowing um, flights in from Mexico. But at the same time, they decide to make it international. They wanna advertise that it's an international airport. So they drop the name Las Cruces Crawford Airport and change the name to what currently is the Las Cruces International Airport. And then this is a picture of the West Airport in like the late 1980s. You can see um, in the far right hand side, the addition of a bunch more hangars and buildings, as well as some more hangars and buildings to the left hand side of um, the image. Now, something I did not know, which I found was interesting and it did make in the exhibit, but I thought it was really interesting was apparently in 2014, 2004, President Bush came to town in doing a fund, not a fundraiser, but running for re-election. And in doing so, they landed a cargo airplane as well as Air Force One out at our little dinky. I mean, it was big enough to support it, but it's still a little airport and managed to put a half mile long, two inch wide gouge in the, um, the airstrip that was out there. So the city sued, <laughs> asked for 2 million, but it ended up getting 600 and $3,724 to do the repairs. Um, which I, I just found kind of an interesting story. We kind of, we, we, the story um, out at, that we have at the museum kind of peters out in the early mid 1980s when kind of a lot of the air, um, carrier airlines kind of stopped functioning out there. So there is a longer history of the West Airport, but out there 
at, at the exhibit, we kind of stop in the mid 1980s. Um, so this was just an interesting story that ended up happening after that point in time. And then of course, starting in 2005 was the first time they really started jockeying for position to have um, you know, the, the newest kind of space flight commercial fleet space flight happening in Las Cruces or the, at least the Las Cruces Doniana County area. And they had a big event out in um, October of 2005 where they had all sorts of different um, oh, innovative aircraft and experimental aircraft and, and missiles and all sorts of things out there to kind of promote the idea that Las Cruces, you know, maybe we, we're not a carrier airline place, but maybe we're the place for the future to happen. And um, the, 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 the galaxy, her, Virgin Galactic, there we go. Virgin Galactic can have their spaceport out here. And of course, you know, because things take time, this was in 2005, and it wouldn't be until 2021 that um, the VSS Unity actually made it up and curved the edge of space. So I think that's how I ended it. Yes. Um, is there anything else I need to? Do with regards to this? If there's any questions. Oh, yeah, sorry. I know that was a lot of material and y'all have been really patient. I've been talking for an hour. <laughs> Are there any questions here or from um, people watching virtually? I think I've got a line of sight. Comments about drag racing in your youth at the airstrip? No? Aw, oh, man. <laughs> Okay, well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jennifer. All right, thank you everyone who uh, tuned in tonight uh, virtually. We appreciate you being here and hope to see you next month uh, for our presentation. Uh, please feel free to come out here to the Good Samaritan Center. Uh, and enjoy that live or tune in again virtually and we will look forward to seeing you then hope you enjoyed the presentation okay, great. well thank you for coming out we appreciate you coming and hope to see you at our next uh our next meeting april 21st or yeah, yeah april 21st <laughs>